All right, so we're going to record this session for our uh, participants online. There's been tef technical difficulties with sharing it for everybody in person. Welcome to Dr. Scott Furland from Seattle Children's. We'll be presenting on bringing single cell genomics closer to the ch clinic for patients with leukemia. Everybody give a big hand to Dr. Furland, please. So thanks for uh, the organizers of, of the meeting today, Tim, uh, for inviting me to talk, uh, Sean and Mark Carlson also for their support. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm a physician scientist, I'm an MD. I um, use uh, genomic technologies to better understand relapse disease, uh, relapse of leukemia uh, in children. Uh, and I am a, a, tr a bone marrow transplanter, so I attend uh, at the Seattle Children's Hospital um, and perform bone marrow transplants uh, on, on our patients who, who need them. Um, we, today, um, I want to share with you really a project in the lab that's just been building over the last year or so. It was really motivated by one patient sample, and I'll, I'll show you most of the data from, from that sample today. But I do want to just take the time uh, right now uh, and acknowledge his sacrifice um, and willingness to participate in research. Um, he really opened our eyes to, to the possibilities of using single cell RNA-seq for residual disease measurement in AML. And um, unfortunately, uh, last month he died uh, after a long battle with AML. Um, and uh, he, he was a great kid um, and had a love of science and we'll really, really miss him. So um, I, devote this talk to him and his family, and, and thank you for listening. Um, so uh, overview, I want to introduce the concept of measurable residual disease, uh, as, as I said, from, from the lens of one of our patients, uh, provide a rationale for the use of single cell genomic technologies to potentially improve measurable residual disease assessment after transplant, uh, share some of our preliminary data, um, highlight uh, some novel molecular and computational approaches we're taking uh, in the lab to enhance MRD, enhance the confidence of MRD assessments. And I won't touch on it today, uh, but by explaining our work in MRD, I hope you'll kind of see the broader applicability of, uh, of uh, single cell genomics to understanding the biology of AML, uh, acute leukemias and mechanisms of relapse. So really, we're just kind of building that toolbox, and hopefully in the next few years, we'll be able to, to, to get even more samples and under, have a greater understanding of, of relapse leukemia. So I have no relevant conflicts of interest or disclosures to make. Um, and so uh, again, going back to our patient, he's a 12-year-old boy, um, and our, his story begins with us uh, when he was diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome in 2018. Myelodysplastic syndrome is a disorder of blood-producing stem cells that produces dysmorphic or malformed or uh, strangely shaped red blood cells, white blood cells, um, as evidenced by the picture here shown in this diagram. And um, unfortunately, um, he went on and evolved to what we call acute myeloid leukemia, which is not uncommon for patients with MDS. Uh, he received the standard of care which is a matched unrelated bone marrow transplant in April of 2019. Uh, and two years later, unfortunately, um, he uh, developed low blood counts again on routine monitoring uh, and was found to have a relapse of his, his, of his disease. Um, after relapse, uh, he underwent reinduction consolidation, or sorry, reinduction chemotherapy uh, and was being considered for a second transplant, this time using a different donor source of cord blood. Um, donor, and but we were we were there was a there was a conundrum, and we were struggling uh, to to figure out what to do next. Uh, we were measuring his disease in the marrow using flow cytometry, and and by doing so, we were achieving measurements in the one to two percent range. So one to two percent of the cells in his marrow were leukemic. Um, but the uh, when we were testing for mutational uh, burden using bulk NGS testing, uh, the variant allele frequencies of those uh, data seem to suggest that he actually had a much higher level of disease, around 10%. And so we really 
we were struggling with this, this conundrum. And, and it was very frustrating for both the treating team uh, and the family, as you can imagine. Um, and you might say, okay, well, you know, he's got relapsed disease, we just treat him, move on. Um, and and there's, there's an important reasons why we can't necessarily do that or why we, we need to be very careful here. So let me explain the sort of nuance clinical, um, uh, the nuances in clinical care for patients who have low levels of disease after transplant. So if you have levels of disease that are less than 1%, you can consider maneuvers to try to boost that graft versus leukemia effect. And those, those maneuvers include altering immunosuppression, giving more donor lymphocytes, potentially treating with chromatin modifying agents to try to boost antigen production by the leukemia in hopes that the graft will destroy the leukemic cells. But we generally don't con consider those maneuvers unless the, unless the disease level is low. So greater than 1%, they won't work. It's just not enough. And when we do this, we can alter the trajectory of relapse for a large number of patients, and we can cure them with just these small maneuvers. On the other hand, if <clears throat> the, the burden of disease is high, um, so if we have greater than 5% of disease, it is generally not considered a good idea to go to a second transplant. The outcomes for patients who have levels of disease greater than 5% are dismal, uh, and therefore we don't even consider really um, taking those patients to second transplant. And so the paradigm or the clinical practice is to reduce the burden of disease by chemotherapy, and then once we achieve less than 5%, taking the patient to second transplant. So you can imagine we, are, we have two tests. One is saying go to transplant, and the other one is saying don't. And this was a real struggle. And so this really opened my eyes into really how the clinical tests that we have for, minimal, for measurable residual disease are not good enough and we need to do better. And so this motivated us to try and use single cell RNA sequencing to try to potentially understand what the real level of disease is. Now, um, given, I want, I'd like to start back up and just give you a little bit of background about how we test for measurable residual disease. Uh, generally, the tests fall into four categories, PCR-based tests, NGS-based tests, so the bulk NGS testing, like I was explaining before, and then multi-parameter flow cytometry is the gold standard for pediatric AML, um, and then chimerism testing is another group of, of, of tests that we use. So let me just go through the strengths and, and, and deficiencies of each one. So PCR tests are really aimed at, at capturing fusion, so RNA fusion, uh, chromosomal translocations, leukemias are you know, often caused by chromosomal translocations, so we can PCR uh, and get those capture those transcripts. They have very high sensitivity, but they're limited in their applicability, and you need to have a priori knowledge about what you're going after with the PCR test. You can't just fish for every fusion, and, and here's why. So we like to say uh, the pediatric AML and, and ALL2 have what's called a long tail. And so these are data that, that Tim alluded to earlier uh, in our collaboration with Tim and Sohel Mashinshi, my mentor. Um, we have 1,210 patients who were profiled on the last cooperative children's oncology group trial, uh, study AML 1031. And we just looked at all the different fusions that we see. You can see uh, the major problem is that a large number of patients don't have a fusion at all. So there's nothing to actually PCR. Um, and then the long tail problem is the other problem. You can't possibly go after all of these. I mean, you could, but it would be very challenging and, and hasn't been implemented clinically. So that's a problem for, the long tail is a problem for molecular assays. And similarly, we don't always, for, for, for mutations, we don't also have, we have to have a priority knowledge and, and there, there's a similar long tail of mutations that are associated with leukemia. So uh, bulk NGS testings are even less sensitive, and so they don't work very well either. In this case, they did show that discrepancy, so that's interesting. So the standard of care um, really in pediatric AML is to use multi-parameter flow cytometry. Um, it's more broadly applicable, it applies to many different kinds of leukemia, um, but it's, a li it's limited in sensitivity, and I think what what our experience with this patient has shown us is that 
it probably is it underestimates the burden of disease. And that's probably for a lot of different reasons, but namely because I think, you know, there's clonal heterogeneity in, in AML in particular, ALL less so. And I think that confounds the ability to detect AML in clinical samples. So <clears throat> additional problems include the fact that it's really hard to run across multiple centers, right? You've got Everybody's using different antibodies, different instruments. Maybe someone didn't bleach it properly. Who knows, right? And so, you know, it's 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 a challenge. Uh, and chimerism testing is not currently sensitive enough to be used uh, as an assay for MRD right now. It's plus or minus 5% on either side. So 10%, that's not good enough. So we, as, as I alluded to earlier, uh, or I might have just said it, um, single cell RNA sequencing, uh, is we think, can meet this need. So um, because uh, single cell RNA sequencing and, and we're 10X genomics here, uh, three prime and five prime uh, measurements, uh, and because of the massive parameter space in genes, the number of genes that we're able to detect in single cells, we think that this will give us a better idea, you know, better ability to differentiate leukemia versus not. And so it will compete with multi-parameter flow cytometry, which is a single cell method, and it can measure many, many, many new parameters. Now, what I'd like to share with you today is our uh, experience using natural variation and mining the data for SNPs and single nu nucleotide variation to further differentiate recipient versus host, I'm sorry, recipient versus donor um, in, in, um, in samples. And I think this is a really important advance and will be a clinically useful tool for single cell chimerism. Uh, we have ongoing work using uh, next generation de de detecting mutations uh, using long read sequencing. And I think Tim alluded to that a little bit earlier. And uh, we are working on trying to detect fusion transcripts in 10x uh, data as well. So we, we think this is an exciting area for development. Uh, we're excited to talk about our experience with the molecular approaches and computational approaches. Um, but, but we need help. Um, we need help from computational people, from molecular people. So, so if there's anything you'd like to reach out to me, you want to get involved, love to hear from you, please, please do so. So what's the deliverable here? I think that we can deliver a more confident assessment of what that level of measurable residual disease is. And um, I think that's the direction that, that we need to move. Okay, so let me tell you about the experiment that we did. Uh, on our patient that I described to you earlier. So we took a bone marrow sample. We really didn't know uh, what the best method for processing the sample would be. There's lots of papers out there on single cell RNA-seq. You usually use FICOL or gradient centrifugation, uh, but we wanted to go step, take a step back and say, okay, what's, what's best? Uh, so we did a uh, red blood cell lysis step on the marrow. We did gradient centrifugation. We also did CD34 enrichment. So we ran the cells through an immunomagnetic column enriching for CD34 with the idea that if flow is right, and we're only at 1%, hey, let's boost this up a little bit so that we can actually see some enough disease to be able to, to look at the genomic profile of it. And then we performed single cell capture using both three prime and five prime 10X, uh, V3, uh, and sequenced those six samples. Um, so three different processing and then two different library preps uh, and to get the data. So I want to talk about a little, I think as we begin to think about scaling these things clinically, I think we also have to think about, you know, is this feasible? I won't get to cost, um, but is it feasible to time, you know, is it feasible to actually do? Um, uh, we collected the sample at, at, in the afternoon on a Thursday, captured the cell later that after, uh, the cells later that afternoon, library preparation we did in one day um, on a Friday. We lost the weekend because the core wasn't open and we now have our own sequencer, but we didn't then. Um, and so uh, we started sequencing uh, 8, 8 a.m. on Monday. Sequencing ran for 24 hours. Um, there's a little delay there, it's partly my fault, but um, the demultiplexing started at in the afternoon on Tuesday and Cell Ranger was done in a few hours. And I was able to look at the data uh, on Thursday evening. So is this feasible for a turnaround? Yes, I think that it is. You know, Flow is a one to two day turnaround time. Those molecular tests, much longer. I think this is, this is, this is feasible to do. And so 
I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about droplet partitioning single cell RNA sequencing. I think a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, suffice to say that the microfluidic device is a workhorse that brings cells and beads, specialized beads together that barcode the messenger RNA from those cells uniquely. And then we perform library preparation and we're able to recover the transcripts that are associated with single cells because of those barcodes uh, that were tagged onto the messenger RNA molecule early on. I want to just point out a fantastic team of, of people I have in the lab doing these experiments and they, uh, who've been leading our, our molecular uh, development work in this space. Sammy and Truti are, are uh, great to have in the lab and they're doing a wonderful job. All right, so I'm just going to skip all over the QC. I know you've probably seen tons of single cell RNA sequencing QC. I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, we know how to do QC. I'm assuming you do too. Um, let's just look at the data. So we know that this patient, this is the flow, his flow cytometry. The blasts here are high for CD34 and low for CD38, which is classic for AML. So what's the first thing we're going to look for? We're going to look for CD34 transcript. So uh, here's a dementia UMAP embedding of the data after filtering, cleaning the data up, removing doublets, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we see is a large hook of cells over here. Now, this is all of the cells, all of the conditions combined. So CD34 enriched, FICOL, and RBC lysis. And then I'm just throwing the three prime data. I'm just going to fast forward and tell you that the five prime data don't look much different than the three prime data. So we'll just get rid of that right now. Um, so three prime data, big, ugly cluster of cells that look concerning. Um, now, this includes the CD34 enrichment. So could, they just, could we just be enriching for the leukemia? And the answer to that question appears to be yes, if these are leukemia, I'll get to that. Um, but this hook uh, it, we see in the CD34 enriched sample, we uh, see many cells in the gradient centrifugation step, uh, cell, uh, sample and the RBC lysis sample. And these are about 10%. So in more agreement with those NGS tests than flow cytometric measurements. Um, but now we have a lot of cells to look at, which is, which is good. Um, okay, so the next thing we really wanted to do was uh, annotate these cell types. So we know that the we suspected leukemia should really shouldn't really cluster with healthy blood cells in the marrow. It should be different. It should be expressing a lot of different other genes. And so the the method that we first used to look at this was um, Surratt's RPCA integ uh, integration. And what that allows us to do is, you know, the reference data set that we're using here, which is from um, Green, uh, Greenleaf Labs publication in, in 2019, uh, is a great reference data set. I highly recommend it for Marrow. We've, we've seen really good performance with that as a reference data set, but it used 10x V2, and we're using V3. And so we had to, you know, obviously do some integration because there's a big difference in, in, in measurements there. So after integrating the data, we see cells, uh, and I'm showing the patient cells here in gray, uh, that cluster with T cells and NK cells, B cells. Uh, we see myeloid cells clustering with myeloid cells. Uh, we see a group of cells. We don't know they're myeloid yet, but they, they cluster with them at least. Uh, it's hard to see on this plot, but behind the gray line there, there's some uh, green cells. Those are red blood cells. So these are red blood cells. And then there's this kind of ugly blob uh, again of cells uh, that looks very suspicious. Uh, the other thing we did to annotate our cells, now where I'm coloring the reference cells gray and I'm, I'm annotating the patient cells using UMAP transform. So I'm taking the UMAP data from the reference and we, we, we rigorously went through their data and we're able to pretty precisely recover their exact embedding, I would say, um, this is this is our our redo of their embedding. It looks really close, and and then we were able to project our data, so the the patient cells onto this UMAP using UMAP transform, and then color the cells by which cells they were most intimate with after that UMAP trans uh, transformation step, and so now we're actually able to annotate the cells using UMAP transform, and that was really uh, helpful. And what what you see is a really disordered pattern of what appear, you know, as best we can tell using this projection method, a pattern of cells that appear to have a disordered differentiation pathway within that putatively leukemic blob. 
and we see you know cells that are most resemble stem cells going to early erythroid cells and then growing straight to monocytes. That's not how red blood cells are supposed to develop. Now this is not development, right? This is just what the best fit is, but nevertheless, it looks disordered. Um, so, and we and we and again we see you know the, the labels that we get, get, got out for our cells using UMAP transform were intimate with the the cluster, the cells that we uh, obtained with the RPCA embedding. Uh, and so, okay, that's great. It actually took a little while to do that. Um, I'd say an afternoon, maybe more, a day. Um, and we want something faster. Um, if we're going to turn this around. I'm not sure RPCA integration, while it's good and fast enough, we want something a little bit faster. So, so, and we like to code. And so we wanted to also kind of create our own classifier. So we uh, created a wish list of things that we wanted to do. And so now I'm gonna just kind of take a break from the patient sample and talk to you about a little bit of a computational tool that we've developed in the lab uh, to help us annotate cells. Uh, we wanted it to work in R. Uh, we wanted to be able to classify cells with one line of code. Uh, we wanted to be fast. We wanted to be able to edit the models or the learning algorithms that that the but that the structure uses. And we wanted it to be UMI account based. In other words, we didn't want to have to take external data sets and do dimensionality reduction and call clusters and see how well it aligned with their calls, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just want to be able to quickly download a data set from Geo, right? And see how our cells annotate relative to that reference in quickly. So we developed a, uh, so, so I, was, I was looking around um, and if anyone has any ideas about why I shouldn't be using a rate fire, please tell me now. But um, I was looking around and I was intrigued by a C++ library called a fire, which is a machine learning library uh, that works using and I'm saying all this, I don't really know it. So um, just I'll just say that out loud. Um, it, it works, it's supposed to work. It does work, we've, we've tested it. It works really well on both CPUs and GPUs. Flips between the two, there's nothing you have to do. It's really nice. Um, and uh, fortunately, the RCPP teams have figured out a way to pr easily create our packages using uh, ArrayFire libraries. And so we can plug into those C++ libraries and it makes it really fast. Uh, and so, you know, this to try to think of a name for this project or this classifier, uh, I came up with the, uh, the word Viewmaster. If you remember, I'm a child of the 80s. So if you remember that old thing, you used to flip through the little uh, wheel, the little reel of pictures and quickly just change your view, right? And that's, that's what we wanna do with single cell RNA sequencing data. We want to take our data and quickly flip through a reel of references and see, okay, yeah, this, this, this looks pretty good, but let's look at a different reference. Let's look at a reference from someone who was sick. Let's look at a reference from, you know, a mouse and, and right, and, and just see how things are similar or different. And, and so it works really well. So let me just show you how uh, we've implemented it um, and how it benchmarks a little bit. Okay. So, uh, the, fortunately, it came pre-baked with some code, so I was able to quickly implement softmax regression, which is otherwise known as multinomial uh, regression, logistic regression. And um, I didn't have to do much other than edit the code a little bit to feed it a Surratt object or a monocle object or you know single cell experiment object. Um, and so the idea here is that we feed it a reference data set. It quickly learns how to classify cells. Uh, based on uh, what we're using is the most variable genes, as, as most packages use, the most variable genes, uh, about 2,500 of those, uh, and then <clears throat> learn uh, using probabilities, uh, the, or, or spitting out probabilities, learn what the appropriate cell type is um, for each one. And because we have a reference already, those labels already there, we can learn, and then we can apply that model, the model that we get from ViewMaster, to take our cells here and quickly um, annotate them to look uh, to, to, to give them labels according to the reference. And it works really well. 
Let me just give you an, ex an overview of an experiment we did to benchmark it. So uh, the reference data set, we held out 80, uh, we trained on 80%, hold out 20 uh, test set, feed it into uh, ViewMaster, develop a model, and then we test, tech it on another bone marrow data set, an, another separate data set where there's an actual cell type. And I say actual because, you know, it's just the label that the authors gave. But then we can compare the actual cell type to the predicted cell type that ViewMaster spits out. And so the two data sets that we used, uh, again, are the, this green leaf reference of, of bone marrow and stem cells. And then you may be familiar with the Surratt BM's uh, uh, site uh, seq data set. I harmonized the labels so that they would they would work. Um, and uh, let me show you what, what it spit out. So using the um, <clears throat> Greenleaf data as a reference and the Surratt data set as a query, uh, accuracy on training is high as you would expect, but the holdout data set is pretty impressive. I don't think it's overfitted, 98% uh, accuracy and 29 seconds to actually do this classification, which I thought was reasonably fast. Um, and then comparing the actual cell type to the predicted cell type um, across the range of different cell types, I think we do pretty well. Um, there's uh, some confounding here of lymphoid progenitors with, um, with uh, pre-B cells. Those are very similar cell types. Uh, but I think there's actually another reason why this is uh, confounded. <clears throat> the Surratt data set has very few numbers of lymphoid progenitors and very few numbers of B-cell progenitors. Uh, I don't think this data set was CD34 enriched very much. This data set here on the left is CD34 enriched, so it has CD34 enriched and unenriched. So I think that's hurt the performance a, a little bit, especially around classifying that more rare cell type. Uh, and then when we do it the opposite way, uh, uh, we do see really nice um, a confusion matrix uh, and, and similar speed, et cetera. So, so we're really uh, want to use this more. People would, would like to weigh in on, on what they think of it, would love to hear it. Um, I'm sure we're, we've got a lot of room for improvement. Um, so that's, that's ViewMaster. Uh, and this is being led by a very talented uh, technician in my lab, Olivia Waltner. OK. so. I alluded to this earlier, but how can we um, also, so going back to that patient sample now, how can we use natural genetic variation to uh, predict whether, or to figure out whether we can find out whether a cell is donor versus recipient? Um, so we're mining the data for SNPs, essentially. And what I wanna point out is that it's really critical to pair this with cell type. So as a transplanter, when I perform a transplant on someone, I'm less worried if their T cells don't become 100% donor. That's not uncommon for T cell engraftment to take a really long time. And they may never achieve 100% donor T cell engraftment. But it's when those myeloid progenitors are anything but 100% donor, that's when I'm worried that it's been a relapse of leukemia. And so that's why pairing single cell chimerism, or at least a genotype demultiplexing, right, with cell type identification, I think is where the advance is and where we're gonna be able to more confidently uh, 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 measure residual disease, if that makes sense. So uh, there's a tool, really great tool uh, that was written by Haynes Heaton. Um, he's at Auburn now and he's agreed to collaborate with us. So we're working with him uh, and extending this uh, package to more data sets. And, and so we're excited to work with, with Haynes. Um, but the idea is that we measure SNPs in reads that align to the genome. And because these reads are tagged with the cell that they came from, it's easy to cluster the cells, not by gene expression, but by SNP genotype. And so we can, this is just data from uh, his paper uh, where there was uh, five samples that were mixed together and then perform PCA on the SNP genotype uh, matrix, the probability matrix that Supercell spits out. And you can see clearly five different clusters of genotypes. And he went on even further to, um, to call cells that kind of had an intermediate um, genotype between two clusters as doublets. And those are genotype doublets, uh, presumably. 
So um, we did this uh, on our patient sample, and we can clearly identify two very different clusters of SNP genotypes. Um, we, we missed some doublets, right? Because uh, when we did our doublet discrimination using scrublet, which is what we usually use, um, it's looking for gene expression and modeling gene expression doublets, doesn't know how to look for genotypic doublets, right? So we found a few extra. Um, and we can color this uh, graph now by cell type. And you can see that there's this sort of smeary cloud of cells that don't really cluster very well into a genotype here. And when we look at what cell types those are, not surprisingly, those are red blood cells. And red blood cells have RNA, but they don't have a diversity of RNA. And so therefore, they wouldn't be expected to have a lot of SNPs in those RNA molecules. So it's reasonable to think that Okay, if, if this genetic demultiplexing gets it wrong, if it's in a red blood cell, I'm going to be a lot less worried about leukemia, right? We don't see, we don't see mature red blood cells as leukemic. So we can remove them. Uh, we get really nice clusters of genotype. And now, and this was just a, a, an amazing, like, wow moment for us was when we colored the cells now. So this is the, you know, the cell type identification. When we color this using genotype, it's so clear that this, these cells are of recipient origin and that this is very likely to be leukemia. Um, uh, now I'm just showing you, you know, what this looks like in the hook embedding, taking it out of the integrated. So this is what the, these are the same cells that were in the hook. Okay. So uh, we're also working to be able to detect mutations in, in, in single cell uh, uh, data. Um, and we might have, like, let's say we have this clinically relevant SNP in exon one of, of the of mutation. And during capture, 10X, uh, we use, you know, a poly, poly T oligo binds poly A, and then we make, you know, cDNA using reverse transcriptase going this way. Um, we might miss that G molecule if we're only sequencing 30, you know, sorry, 90 reads into the back of the molecule. So we're not going to capture that G. But if we take, and, you know, because then we fragment the library, et cetera, et cetera. But if we take the full length cDNA that we get from 10x before fragmentation, we might be able to recover reads that have um, uh, uh, that mutation embedded in them. The other accident that we can sort of take advantage of when we look at this is the fact that poly, uh, D, poly T oligos will bind to internal po uh, A repeats within the molecule. And so you will actually get some coverage randomly in other parts of the molecule. And so we can take advantage of that. And there was a really nice algorithm um, called CB Sniffer that was written to do exactly this, is to mine uh, 10x data specifically for mutations in, um, in molecules just using the standard 10x and, and relying on this priming that happens internal uh, to the molecule. So we did, we ran uh, CB sniffer. Um, again, here's the, the, the genotype calls on the left. And here I'm showing all of the calls for the TP53 mutation that we're able to identify. And you can very clearly see that the mutated TP53 cells are in uh, the hook and wild type or not. So not too surprising, but still um, pretty clear, black and white. Um, when we look at IDH1, what is really interesting is that there seems to be a lot more tumor heterogeneity with respect to uh, IDH1 mutations. Um, and so we see you know, about 50% of the cells have wild type, even the, even the leukemia have 50%, 50 have wild type IDH1. And so, um, as I alluded to earlier, we went back to that uh, unfragmented library. And with the help of Jason Underwood, who's a uh, principal scientist at PacBio, we're working on using hybridization capture to pull down those molecules early on and then sequence them with long reads. And I only have a snippet of data to show you. I wish I had more. Um, but here's our coverage of the IDH1 locus. And we see that nice 50% uh, ratio of, of IDH1 mutant 
uh, to IDH1 wild type. And so we're, we're working on computational approaches to be able to pull the PacBio data and integrate it with the short read data. Um, and so that, that's uh, more to come on that front. But this looks really promising in our ability to actually recover molecules and increase coverage over important, clinically important areas of the genome. So how does this extend to another patient? So I've got another patient, um, we've uh, another two-year-old, uh, she had uh, undifferentiated leukemia. So this is a really rare uh, leukemia that doesn't fit under the ALL bucket or the AML bucket. And we were able, and she was, uh, and her parents were uh, um, kind enough to let us take extra marrow. Uh, and she had had an unrelated cord blood transplant and looked like she had early evidence of relapse after transplant as well. So we used ViewMaster and we used Supercell and we're clearly able to identify um, a large number of cells here uh, that, that looked, I won't go you know, step by step through this. Uh, it's pretty clean. These are recipient origin uh, and they all look like uh, early erythroid to HSC like cells. Um, but in this uh, experiment, we added SightSeq. Um, and so for those of you who are uh, maybe unfamiliar with SightSeq, SightSeq, SightSeq is you know, using oligo-tagged antibodies uh, to on 10x data or, or other platforms to measure cell surface proteome. And um, so what we're working on now is, in, is, is, is marrying clinical flow data to the uh, SightSeq data that we get from the same sample. So here I have the clinical flow data on the left uh, we have, you know, high CD34, low CD38, et cetera. Uh, and then this is the, we recapitulated the same looking plot using flow data. Uh, it's not flow data, sorry. Cell surface Im immunoproteome data. Uh, and this time we have 150 surface molecules that we've measured uh, on these samples. So there's a lot of opportunity to discover new molecules that are associated with leukemia. And you can see very similar uh, trends. Um, uh, so, you know, high for CD34, negative for CD38, uh, high for CD34, intermediate for CD7, et cetera, 56 negative. And so there's, a, there's a, you know, this, this works. Um, and, and I think this is another exciting area of development um, and, and how we can, you know, kind of marry clinical flow with molecular techniques um, in the future. So the other thing I think we can do with this is maybe we will learn, you know, new new immunophenotypic markers that are associated with leukemia, and potentially improve multi-parameter flow cytometry, and 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 really uh, push that envelope as well. So I'm excited to see what what happens there. This is being led by uh, two scientists, uh, Melinda Bianaki, who's a medical oncologist, and uh, Xu Yan Chen is our uh, resident or collaborating. Um, hematopathologist and, and her expertise in clinical flow has been really invaluable in this project. So where are we now? We've profiled uh, seven samples, five I'm showing here. They show good correlation here. The number of blasts that we detect by single cell RNA sequencing on the x-axis, the number of, of blasts or leukemic cells we detect using flow cytometry. There's good correlation. I'm circling the samples that where I think where flow is actually getting it a little is, is underestimating the burden of disease, um, potentially. Um, we have two patients who have PCR positivity but are flow negative, and we're working to analyze that. And we did uh, intriguingly find one uh, in one of the samples, one cell of early myeloid lineage and, and recipient uh, origin. So, so in summary, um, you know, inconsistencies in clinical assays are an, have been an important motivator for this project, and I think have motivated me to improve diagnostics for leukemia. Uh, integration of single cell data with genetic demultiplexing, can, I think, will ultimately provide a more confident assessment of relapse after transplant. Uh, I think we have promising preliminary data suggesting we can augment coverage, in, coverage using uh, alternative molecular approaches on 10x data. Uh, we have uh, nice uh, immunoproteomic data showing that we can recapitulate clinical flow. Um, and uh, we want to increase our sample numbers. Uh, we want to build our toolkit further, our computational toolkit, detect fusions, be able to mine those data, integrate it with uh, UMAP embeddings, and um, expand the toolkit even more. Uh, ultimately, I haven't talked at, at all about this, and I think 
I hope that you know by talking about MRD, you can kind of see the potential for this to really explore mechanisms of relapse, you know, HLA expression on the leukemia, uh, antigen processing machinery. Uh, we can look at T cell exhaustion, myeloid suppressor cells. Uh, but we need uh, money. So if you know anyone who has any, um, yeah, give it. Please let me know. Uh, and we also need people. So um, uh, we're hiring uh, at SERI. Um, and I'll just put this up here. So Sean, uh, put Sean's email on there. And Jay, who I see sitting in the back, uh, please contact them. If you have any more information and are interested in working with us, uh, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, lab, uh, my clinical coordinators and, and clinical help mentors, of course, our patients and their families, um, funding sources. And with that, I'll uh, take a break and we can have questions. Um, yeah, very great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering, it's, I mean, um, seven samples, I guess, is still the beginning to draw patterns, but often, uh, you know, you can have very fast algorithms, but if you, you know, if you need manual curation, um, that's the time consuming part. So if you have to spend a week to understand the, you know, what uh, maybe progenitor population you are dealing with, that's the, you know, the pipeline. So I was wondering, how think you uh, how much you think you can uh, you know automate this process how much think how much you think you know leukemia is such heterogeneous that you need a person for a week for each case that you have to analyze or yeah it's a good question i don't i mean right we don't know because we haven't done enough samples but 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 it's pretty fast once we get it rolling you know the viewmaster Pretty, has pretty confident assessment and can differentiate a T cell and a red blood cell and a myeloid progenitor. That's really all we need. We're not asking a lot. So, so we see, you know, recipient chimerism in a T cell, we're going to be less worried. We see recipient chimerism in a red blood cell, less worried. We see recipient chimerism in a myeloid progenitor for AML, at least. Uh, that's, that's problematic. And so, yeah, we'll need to do more samples to see if the algorithm falls down in some cases, uh, differentiating T cells from leukemia. I don't think that's gonna happen, but we'll, we'll only time will tell. Yeah, I'm just, gonna... I'm just gonna squeeze in here. To be really accepted by this crowd, I think it needs to be ViewMast R. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure, sure, okay, yeah, I love it. Uh, we'll do that, yeah, we'll change the name. Um, just um, a question about the mutation detection with ISOSeq. So, like PacBio is saying that they've got much greater fidelity of detection of mutations, and there was also a whole recent Twitter thread saying how we expect to see a certain amount of missed calls within 10x just due to the actual artifacts within that. Are you seeing much difference between the mutation calls in 10x and the isoseq and if so which do you think has greater fidelity yeah um don't know enough to answer that question intelligently yet but um uh i will say that um the tso artifact that we think confounds the uh, ability to sort of just PCR off of 10X libraries and put them on a short read sequencer. We've done that experiment, put it on Illumina. We see real problems with a TSO artifact. And so part, I didn't include that because it's just getting a little bit too inside baseball, but um, I, we, we have a TSO depletion step that we're doing to try to minimize that 10X artifact. So hopefully uh, we're addressing it, but I, I think we need, more data to answer that question fully. Yeah, 
it was a great talk and then it was really great to see that our research can be applicable in the real patients. I just wonder uh, that whether you're, I mean, you are kind of planning to utilize this information from single cell assays in the maybe future treat, uh, patient treatment or anything. Yeah, that, I think so. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the goal, I think. Uh, what, what what would be my long-term vision um, is, and I don't know how well this would work in, you know, de novo AML or regular vanilla leukemia, but I think after transplant, you know, mining the data for genetic variation is a huge advance and, and gives me a lot of confidence as a treating physician that we're seeing uh, a true relapse. And so I think that you know, as we think about mobilizing this clinically and what are the next steps, I think transplant patients make the most sense to sort of roll this out. And then hopefully, I mean, we're, you know, a transplant is expensive. We're already spending a ton of money on these patients. What's, you know, three to $5,000 more for a 10X one? Scott, for clarification, just in case anybody here doesn't know how ridiculously expensive it is to treat this disease, what's the median cost to treat successfully or otherwise a pediatric AML patient? Yeah, so so a transplant, you know, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I'll say it. Um, so we ask for, for, for patients who come in out of the country, don't have insurance uh, within the country, we ask um, for usually between half a million and a million dollars up front. Um, to do, to do a bone marrow transplant, so so it's not cheap, um, and so you know a couple of ten x runs, it's like a drop in the bucket. So we got some questions online as well. I think Sean was going to take. Yeah. One. So so Scott, um, Jared Andrews, did we? Okay, Jared Andrews asks, why not use something like single R, and he has the capital R. I, um, we, we did we did look at that, um, and there was a reason, but I don't remember what. Yeah, single R is good, and we've used it in other settings. Uh, we just kind of wanted to write something. Is that all right to say? Um, and then uh, Ryan Thompson asks, how does this method handle cells with ambiguous expression, i.e. expression that is intermediate between two or more cell types? And then you followed up to say, to clarify, since several methods were discussed, I'm referring to the cell type annotation method. Yeah, so we're working on that. I mean, there's a there's a max function at the end of the, the multinomial classifier that just takes the maximum. Uh, and so we're toying, this isn't really gonna answer the question, but but we're toying, or we've implemented a threshold. And so maybe we, you know, we're thinking about using, uh, you know, only the cells that have a probability greater than X and, and saying that those are more confident cell types. But but yeah, we, we've more work to do on those sorts of questions. And so, um, yeah, more to come there. Some more questions in person? There are more online if there's no in person. Yeah, jump, jump in now before you get crowded out by this pesky virtual folks, right? <laughs> no. no, okay. All right. Um, Eric uh, Cuevas asks, what data is used from SNPs to cluster cell types, if present, allele, position, LD? Yeah, so it's a, it's a, there's a variant calling step. You get a VCF file, then you quantify the variance uh, and get a matrix of reference and alt, and then Supercell takes uh, the ref and alt matrix and then does its magic and spits out something. The answer, yeah. All right. Um, do we have time for one more? Okay. May Woods asks, uh, do you think there should be a standard set on the number of cells sequenced for single cell approaches since mutations in cells circulating at low frequency will be subject to sampling variants? Uh I don't know. I mean, I don't think we would use, and I can't envision a situation where we would say, you know, oh, one cell has one mutation and we're going to, you know, alter treatment based on that. So I think we'd, um, I don't think we're in danger of that because I think what we need to do when we, we implement um, single cell genomics clinically is we need to 
look at multiple parameters at the same time. And so I don't think we're going to be sort of hamstrung by, you know, one, one cell and, and an aberrant measurement in, in that way. I don't know if that really answers the question, but. And maybe you might, one possible answer might be is that as long reads um, start to potentially become more and more certain, we know that one cell can restart leukemia. So maybe at some point it, yeah, it does become sure. feasible, but right now, yeah, you said probably not. <laughs> right, right now, yeah, we got, we got a slow, well, slow roll into this. But. May follows up, she says, but it's not one cell if you sample 5,000 cells. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I get the question, but. Sounds like an email. Yeah, might, it, might, email me, yeah. Might, might sure. work. Yeah, yeah, email me, let's, let's talk. Okay, thanks everyone, I appreciate it. Continuing the glorious streak of ending on time. Everybody enjoy lunch and uh, please uh, be sure and check out the workshops this afternoon. Thanks everybody. Another big hand for Scott if you'd be so kind. And our birds of a feather coming up this afternoon. <laughs>